Is tape dead? <laughs> <laughs> we hope not. <laughs> yes, Do you have marked vehicles? We 
going to probably be 85% slot. Uh, we do, I think, a poor job of, of selling to, as Sean has figured out, to more meet the needs. But we're um, filling the need instead of maybe selling a solution or meeting the needs. Um, they need off site storage to check off some of the funds box. And, and something where they've seen something on TV that scares them and they want to do it. We do it and if they want it in a tub, we can leave it in a tub. They want it slide, we slide. Are the percentages you guys are using is a percentage of revenue or client base? I'm sorry? The percentages that you're using. Of, of tanks that are in the mall. So tanks versus client storage. But is it revenue? No, it's a program base. So if you've got 100% of total storage, in my case, it was 60 and closed 40% open. Revenue is high for you know you can slot storage. Rob, you have to slotted tapes versus tapes being stored inside containers. I understand that, but if you say is it space, is it space, is it revenue, is it, space, is it, revenue? Is it yeah, the number of tapes? Is it units? Is it what is it? Slots? Units. That's units. units. Yeah, units. Units. Mm.
And um, initially, we had some pretty impressive guards that, you know, had the clue. And, and if I had to come in at work at night and it was dark and, and you know, I didn't feel concerned about guarding a bullet in the pocket. Um, but <laughs> these guys, all one by one, and we had six of them that worked in a 24 hour schedule. I mean, we had multiple coverage 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, it was quite expensive. But they all moved back to Vegas to take their old jobs in casino security and make more money. Um, so the next round of guys that we came in, you know, they were just inept. And plus, we looked at the economies and what we were getting for it, and the people we were competing against didn't have our cards. Uh, plus, we had guys with guns that had access to places that we really didn't want them to have access to. And I'm not sure these guys could pick their nose, much less put a bullet in it. And it, it was a little bit scary to go to work at night and hope that just because I parked my car at 10 o'clock at night and walk around the bushes that who thinks I'm a, you know, somebody I'm not, I'm supposed to be here. It was scary. So the, the whole moral of that story is whether it's exclusive runs with this same client, we're going to get ready to this client, what we will get, uh, what we'll do is to run to the facility and back. Now, we didn't get them to compromise because there's one stop in between that's also their facility. So half of the inventory will come from two facilities, and they are going to allow us to stop at the other facility that is owned by them as well. And that was like pulling teeth. They're very angry about it. And we told them we'd do it, and we gave them the price for each. And they decided that the cost wasn't, didn't justify the need, so to speak. So just don't, don't load it up and think they will come because it's not always going to pay dividends, whether it's the other extreme, though, is if you recall when I first started jabbering that uh, made big mistakes. The first mistake we made, the first van I ever bought was in 84. It was a, uh, Chevy Astro van. No insulation, no radio, uh, it had no air conditioner, it was nothing. Now, if you know anything about the climate in Winston Salem, it's not Miami, but it's not Cleveland or Columbus, Ohio either. It can get pretty hot. And I had a client call me one day, this was back in the days of, you know, brown rivers, which we still get. 30 cents a month for a while. But a guy called me and he goes, Chris, can you explain why two of my tapes are stuck together? <laughs> he goes, it looks like they were melted together. And I said, it's hot outside. <laughs> How do you monitor the quality of your service?
trying to flow out. So we're, we're moving them down towards more, you know, sort of a three or a four hour time range. But as big as we can get now, the sales guys are instructed to get as big a time range as we can for deliveries. So that's how we wanted deliveries. Um, delivery of tapes, we probably don't track it as much as we should. I don't know really, it would be a very difficult thing to track because there's always exceptions as to whether or not customers get tapes. What tapes they get, they tell us we don't know. Um, especially when you're doing syncs and mainframes. Uh, if, you, if we've got a problem with a tape, we normally know because the customer comes up and says, where's the tape? Why didn't we get it? Um, do we track those? We, we track the number of um, free deliveries that we do. If we do do a free delivery, and we would do a free delivery if it was our problem. Um, we do track those. Um, that's just the manual process. just goes in and it's done on the building. So we work out exactly how to do the job. I think if the question is how do you manage your quality control, you've got to be honest with them. And how do you find quality control? Right? So if my definition, which my definition of, of service is that we've got nothing that we didn't do that the customer was expected. And you reconcile that through effort every day in that the customer doesn't call and say, hey, what happened to take one, two, three, four, it was supposed to come today. You've got to look at them on per, per, case, per case basis and really diagnose what you wrote that issue. So from a tape standpoint, that's usually the biggest area of service concern and the biggest complaint the customers will make is when they're not getting the right items that have on schedule. You've got to have <coughs> the ability to have trend as well as mechanisms in place that will effectively track when mistakes are made. Who does that? And that's the question. Because many people are running operations and have very few people. Um, they don't have 35 people sit on the One guy's a quality control officer, for example. It's daily collection of data. Using your example, the, the dispatch or the driving supervisor, the lead driver, going through the daily logs and finding out if they have met all the delivery criteria. And then you state what the delivery window is, find where the driver is. If you're using GPS tracking, you can audit that. If your driver's know you're auditing that, you have the ability to go back and find out if you're getting your time limits. Because I think if you're waiting for your customer to call you until you got a problem, you've got a bigger problem with that. Um, second thing is, with the tape rotations, we go through a practice of collecting data every day to monitor one production, how many items we need to rotate today, but also how fast we do it. The last component is that, how many errors were reported doing that. So if I'm a librarian and I know Tony put away the tapes last night, I don't have to pull a tape, and I find that the tape is in the wrong spot, I'm going to report that as an error. Um, so we don't pull it that. We, uh, we don't collect uh, probably the data that we should on the delivery performance. Um, we basically have AM and PM orders, so we try not to uh, restrict our drivers to a two hour window, three hour window, four hour window. Our salespeople say two hour window. Um, and but typically, by the time we have signed up the account, sent in the, the tape librarians, they have given us the, what I call the front end of the window, which is when the backups are supposed to be done. And then we agree on a or P, and typically is, is the way it works. Um, so we, I do think we do a pretty good job of tracking issues, and we call them incidents, or we have an incident report that is generated for anything that is not done as it should have been that would generate a non-revenue producing activity, meaning, as Tony said, we're going to do something free. Free is not good for the P&L. Um, so we track those. We track them by client. We track them by, they include the employees involved, what actions were taken with the employee, what actions were taken with the client. And uh, then those things are, are monitored, and we capture them as a percentage of total work orders delivered. And we have, uh, you know, 
two years worth of data is how far we've been into this thing officially. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty pleased with our performance, but it can always be better. Um, I, you know, I think one of the most disgusting things that, that I see out there today is, is that um, people are not willing to pay for service that is excellent, yet they want service that is perfect. And the reality is that trying to teach your people that we're very service oriented, and yet we have to make a living, and we have to pay the bills, so it's almost like you are accepting something that is less than what you want. And I call it good enough or mediocre, but if we're charging, good enough or mediocre, and we're performing at excellent or perfect, guess where our profit went? It went to take us from good enough or good service or meeting our, because, you know, we're held in on meeting our commitments to our clients. Anything above that, and we used to in our marketing cloud for years and years, and every now and again, still slips in there. We want to meet and or exceed our expectations. I'm charging them to meet, and every day I exceed. I'm spending more money than I need to keep client happy. Sorry, about so. Jim, um, what we do is, and what I found in doing quality programs is, the most difficult thing is obtaining information that an error occurred. So what we have is we call it a client exception form so that our employees, whatever, don't view it as, you know, one of their coworkers failed. So we keep the vernacular with it very light. And like Sean, we categorize it very heavily. Um, you know, was it a TMS account? Was it a case rotation? Was it electronically requested or was it a phone fax, email order? know, go through that process of <clears throat> quantifying the grouping trend of what went wrong and then have a management process <clears throat> meeting to follow up and go through the corrective actions, um, <clears throat> you know, and the last always which is employee performance. So we ask the tough questions. <clears throat> is the policy and procedure we have in place perfect? Or was it flawed? Did the procedure cause the error? And then the next one, you know, okay, we had the procedure. Did management do a good job training? You know, is the employee absolutely dead positive of what the procedure is? And then the final step is obviously, you know, the procedure is good. They've been trained. Employee made a bad decision. Early on, when you start. Early on when you start the process, if you start the process, we experienced the same thing when there was a bit of reluctance to say, hey boss, I screwed it up. But guess what? When the client calls, I mean if there's a screw up and the client calls, who are they going to call? They're going to call me to let me know. And then I'm going to go in backwards, trust me, you know, the hell of the day is worse if it comes from the client versus if it comes from internally, then I can be proactive and call the client. And so quickly, they also learn though, that it is a very low this is not something that, that we tell them up front. This is not going to be made a part of your personnel record until you have three of these for the same thing. I mean, it not only will be a part of your personnel record, we'll escort you to the door. <laughs> but so um, the other cool thing we started this year was, and we're still searching for a name for the group, but for lack of a better term, it's an intervention group where we have a small group of our employees that are at the hourly level that we're getting involved in the resolutions to the problem. They're the ones that see why the problems are created to begin with. And part of that intervention is going to be the inclusion of the employee or employees that were involved in making the mistake. Yeah, I think in the last, in the last six months we implemented two programs. One is along the line which was talking about, the other was along the line which was talking about. We actually bonus our employees for performance, which is a new program we just put in place. It's all based off of performance, um, evaluation of performance for how
high production employees as well as mistakes. They actually lose part of the bonus if they make a mistake. So what motivates an employee to raise their hand and say, I made a mistake? Um, there might be issue. I think that if you have a focus group, and that's what you're talking about, you have a focus group that's, that's, that's meeting once every two weeks or every month or something along those lines, whatever variable you need to have, whatever that is, you're talking about what is scaling your process and, and open communication. Um, I'll sit in that meeting and there's no stripes. You know, I'll sit there and I want to hear from the employee's perspective, look, this is why this program is exposed to not work. You know, Jim Bob delivered the wrong container to the wrong customer last week. Well, why did that happen? Do we take him out back and flog him or do we, <laughs> or do we, or do we work out the issue or cause the issue? So, you know, it's a procedural at that point. So I think you got to have a good gauge is that, you know, business, this business is going to continue to evolve. And then going back to the online versus offline discussion, this is the beginning. I mean, there's things that are going to change. The business in five years' time will look very different. That's my opinion. That doesn't mean everything's going online. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it's just going to be different. Your customers are going to want different things. The security measures you're looking at today are going to look different. Maybe tomorrow. The technology is going to look different. Um, and, and that's what's going to continue to change. Um, the way of finding change now, majorly, is actually doing take changes for customers, providing that actual service. We are, we've, we've got a dedicated run now of people going out and just doing tape changes that is moving them into the very good money. It is very good. It's a very good run. So it is over here too. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. I can go back to an example in 1993 when we were running 60,000 a month instead of once a night. So, sure. not. The other thing we do is, you know, a lot of, you've seen number of injury-free days, you know, people pose for workers' comp, et cetera. Uh, in our vaulting operations, we post on a big board error-free days, you know, and depending on which operation, you know, they might be doing 20, 25, 30,000 transactions a day, and we track how many days can they go without any error. I bet that's interesting on the day after an error when the tour's coming through, isn't it? <laughs> One day. <laughs> yeah. It's happened. I'm doing business with Cintas. We haven't made a mistake since yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Does it show fractions? <laughs> we, when the comes yeah. time for me yeah. client tour, we just add two zeros. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Jeff, are you are you bonusing the employees based on your three days and also as a team? Well, like Sean. When you tie tangible things to quality, and the number one criteria is to get good, clean information. I've wrestled with it. Um, sort of parallel to a manufacturing setting where they're looking for safety three days. I mean, well, our yeah. industry, obviously. But, but I don't want to create anything that keeps one of my employees from making an error known. And, you know, their friend Mary, who works in this group, isn't going to get her bonus because they tell me about a mayor. Then am I getting good, clean information? Uh, so what we try and do is we keep it real low key. We say, you know, every time you beat your days of error free, you know, we'll, we'll buy the entire work group lunch, have a pizza party, a cookout, whatever. So we keep the reward not monetary, but more recognition-based. And the people are proud. You know, I walk in, I, you know, several facilities, I walk in the facility and the employees have got, hey Jim, you can work 72 days. And they're proud of the fact that they can deliver perfection day in and day out. But then don't you have the same problem? So let's say 72 days was, was it, and now you know, Mary's got to tell on Joanne, who yeah. Just blew it on day 71 and then there. I mean, There's some of that, but I think it's less when it's not monetary. You know, if it's just purely recognition, yeah, the chances of them not reporting is less than if I have dollars to do. Do you, do you define an acceptable number? Hey, hey, can I just ask? The gentleman up here has been trying to ask a question. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> do you? <laughs> Is, do you think you're going to buy the letter, man? If not, it'll get butchered on the list, sir. 
<laughs> do, people think, do people think there's a role for defining an acceptable amount of errors? Is, is there a role for defining an acceptable amount of errors? So obviously, if, you, if, if, you, if you're doing business, you you're inevitably going to make an error every once in a while. So is there, is, is in your operation there any path for defining what is and isn't an acceptable quantum of error? I've Zero. Yeah, I mean, it's like every year when we do the budget, you know, we've got a line item on there for uninsured losses. You know, how much crap are we going to tear up with our forklifts? This is on our warehousing side, not in our record side. But, you know, so what am I going to do? Predict and admit that, yeah, I can probably say we're going to have some uninsured losses because somebody, but I don't think it makes sense to say our number for this year is uh, we're going to have 0.5%. So half of one percent error rate is acceptable. Because why I ask is this this is what Iron Mountain went through obviously eighteen months ago, that after they had a few bad incidents that they attempted to define what their error rate was and then obviously say that that was an excusable error rate. Maybe I can answer that question. You know Gerard saying what Iron Mountain said. Okay. It wasn't a fact of being inexcusable. It was just the facts, as you stated before, that there are errors, and we're human beings, okay? And you'll see on your list, sir, today, there's another data loss, okay? And it's human error, it's truck driver, he's been fired. What I Am Mountain was trying to say on the 99.9% was that this was our delivery rate there are errors, humans make mistakes. UPS was at 89, Federal Express was at 87 or 88, and we, we all make errors. We were just saying that with the precautions we take and the security and everything, it's been almost 100%, but, but not perfect, and none of us are perfect. If I'm a consumer buying a service, and somebody tells me we're perfect, or we don't make any mistakes, I'm suspect. So I agree with the statement that you report the facts. If somebody asks me what our error rate is, I'll tell them. That's the facts. It's not acceptable, it's just what it is. And if somebody, if, again, if I am buying a service and they say, we are perfect, we never make mistakes, then I'm not going to buy from them because the first thing we've established is they have trouble with the truth. I've heard a good saying that perfection is impossible, but pursuit of it is not. So I think if you live in the world of constantly striving for perfection, as obviously you guys do in your business, as that will show through to the client. Yeah, as we will do. Okay. And again, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a key, you know, and many of you have heard me speak before, uh, as an industry, We've all done a good job. We can talk about it. As long as you've got human beings in the mix, you can't, you can't not that. You can't get that to 100%. There's always going to be a manual way around the automated process. There's someone's going to take it while you're fine. You're going to find the example no matter what the situation is, field scanning, no field scanning, carding, not carding. You're always going to have that one situation that you just can't stop. So, so what we're talking about basically is not about whether we're 100% correct or not. How do we manage the errors that are inevitably going to yes. And the issue is how do you, you know, the reward perfection, even though we know it's not going to happen, or maybe, maybe just by a completely different concept and say we're going to reward the guy who comes up with a problem and a solution for it. So you encourage more problem solving by your own employees. Great idea. I think Jeff was correct. <laughs> Did you have a question <laughs> over here? <laughs> when Sox first came out, I didn't notice this to be a real big issue, but recently Sox auditors have really been coming down and getting hard on accountability for every transaction when they take those for mm -hmm. We're seeing this more and more. How are y'all providing that information to your clients? What, what, what steps are y'all taking for the Sox? 
PCI app or PCI auditors? Yeah, I mean, auditors are auditors. I think they're an interesting species. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was telling somebody last night, I think, uh, uh, they made it Mr. Arden I was talking about locked tubs versus unlocked tubs. And when I worked in Atlanta for SafeSite, I had an auditor, I mean, one of our large clients come in and, and just right to some of the goals because um, their tubs were unlocked. And what was to stop us from going in and having access to their information at all? Same auditor, roll the clock forward 12 months, same auditor comes in. We have since come into compliance, locked the cases, wired these cases locked, wrote us up again because how do you know what's in there? There might be an explosive device. I mean, you can't win. It just, Every time the wind changes direction. Wouldn't you demand that your drivers cite the contents of the cases prior to them going into the vents? And it is, it is dark. And this was, you know, we were picking up 40, 45 times at the time. So, I mean, it's check the tub number off and fly. Try to remember to close the back door.
Is that an Australian <laughs> word? <laughs>
TMS or mainframe clients, how are you handling a customer that doesn't want, in, in a situation where you're scanning their, their trioptic uh, label? Do you guys put your own barcode on it to identify the client? Never for a mainframe. We would always use their label. So if, if you got a bunch of six digit vault series that fall in your aisle, how do you identify which ones belong to which customer? They fall into where? Sorry, yeah, the an example of a van tipping over or a show. <laughs> 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 But it's pretty, it's, so it's feasible to have duplicates. Oh, definitely. Okay. Within the vault, yes. Um, we tend to, we group customers all together for a start. So all customers take to go into one area of the vault. Okay. Um, but we would also put an identifier on them, which would just be made up of a customer number and media type. Okay. But, but can I just add so you're applying an additional label to it. Sorry? <laughs> you're applying that additional label to it, which is just that. We could write those here. So the label's right there. They're just a customer number. What if they don't let you put that on the flange, like on a 3490 or any kind of cartridge? Sorry. What if they don't let you put it on the tape? 